Hi everyone, George Crum here, editor at Fish Alaska Magazine and Stillwater columnist. Here to talk to you today about using chronomid pupa imitations in South Central Alaska lakes. I first started using coronamid pupa imitations in lakes back in 1988 in eastern Washington. Areas like Lenore Lake, Dry Falls Lake, Lenice Lake, Nunnally Lake, and others provided good fishing. And if you knew how to fish coronamid pupa, you did better than some of the other, the other guys out there. When I first moved to Alaska in the early 90s, I seem to have forgotten all about chronomids for a while because I heard that all you had to do was troll around a woolly booger and you'd do just fine. That's true to a certain extent, even today. You can go out there and troll a woolly booger around all day long and catch your share of fish. But sometimes, fishing with chronomid pupa imitations, especially during the first half of summer, can be unbelievably productive. And there are certain times, although it doesn't happen very often, that fish in Alaska's lakes become selective, preferring to eat, to eat coronamid pupa over other food items for a certain period of time. So learning how to fish coronamid pupa is important. You may, you may be wondering, well, what's a coronamid pupa? If you haven't been doing much still water fishing in your life, you may not know. There are a lot of different coronamid pupa imitations out there. They're a fairly simple fly. There's an example right there. This one happens to be kind of reddish. Notice the curved body shape, kind of looks like a comma, and in the water these actually hang vertically like this as they ascend from the bottom up to the surface to hatch. Some other examples, same sort of design, very simple, fly to tie. Uh, this is a black snow cone. Another variation, drastically different color, is Phil Rowley's Chromie. Now the pupa, as they ascend, tend to accumulate gases under their exoskeleton, just under the skin, and this actually helps buoy them to the surface. They do wriggle um, to get themselves off the bottom and, and to start the ascent, but if they're hatching in deep water especially, eventually the gases under their skin help buoy them to the surface, and they don't even wriggle very much. They just rise to the surface as if some magnetic force is pulling them there. Once they reach the surface, the pupa flattens out on the surface film, the thorax splits open, and the adult crawls out onto the surface of the water, where it may sit for anywhere from 3 to maybe 20 seconds before it flies away. Here's something that's interesting. In the lower 48, fish do eat the adult chronomids as they're resting on the surface film. Up in Alaska, they don't do it very often, very rarely, and very rarely do big fish get drawn to the surface to eat chronomid pupa even when there's a heavy coronamid hatch in progress. So, it's important to fish the coronamid pupa. Some people like to fish the larval form of the coronamid, uh, sometimes called a blood worm. I have. I've caught fish on them, but I tend to do better by focusing on using the pupa. I'm going to talk about a couple different ways to present a coronamid pupa today, and I'm going to go over the gear that I've been using for the past couple of years that helps me to be successful. But before I do, let's look a little bit more at some of the flies that I use and what I carry with me in my float tube when I head to the lake. This is one of my coronamid pupa boxes, and you can see there's a number of flies in there. There are a number of colors and a number of sizes. However, I don't go crazy on the sizes. In Alaska, there aren't that many people fishing coronamid pupa, and our fish haven't gotten very smart. So simple coronamid pupa imitations like the snow cone still work. What's more, although I've seen coronamids as small as probably size 22 hatch and as big as perhaps a size 10 or even a size 8, the flies that I use most often are sizes 10, 12, and 14. If I had to pick one of those sizes, I'd pick a 12. Most of the time, I'll tie on a size 12 snow cone and have plenty of success 
regardless of whether or not the actual flies that are hatching are that size. As I mentioned previously, there are two techniques that I typically employ when I fish coronamid pupa imitations in Alaska. The one that I use most often involves using a floating line and a strike indicator, and I typically use a nine foot five weight rod for that. Starting at the very end, obviously we've got a fly. I tie that fly onto my tippet with a non-slip mono loop knot. Maybe you can see that a little bit better when it's not wiggling. The non-slip mono loop knot is important because it allows the fly to wiggle around as the indicator is jiggling. Any ripples on the surface of the lake make the fly move in that manner and that is deadly. The, the trout have a hard time refusing that. The tippet that I use most often for my coronamid fishing, since I'm using flies that are size 14 to size 10, is 3x tippet. And I typically will tie about a three foot section of 3x tippet to the rest of my leader. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Some of you wonder about tippet. Is tippet line higher quality than regular fishing line? Yes, it is. It's, it's definitely higher quality, more refined, and I recommend you use fluorocarbon tippet. There are a number of different brands out there. Most of the reputable name brands are good, and some of the ones that I've been using lately, actually for a few years now, are Rio Floroflex. Floroflex Leader and 3X is great for chronomids. I also use a Scientific Angler's 3X fluorocarbon tippet as well. Both of these work very, very well. Very difficult for this angler to determine whether one is better than the other. They both have worked very well with minimal numbers of broken off fish. Okay, I mentioned I have three feet of teeper, uh, uh, tippet. To that, I connect to my main leader. And when I'm fishing coronamid pupa with a floating line under an indicator, my, my main leader is a level section of eight pound test monofilament or fluorocarbon. On this particular rod, I've got eight pound test sunline fluorocarbon. It's looped onto the loop of my floating fly line. I use about 10 feet of this, maybe eight feet if I don't anticipate fishing very deep. And to that, I have three feet of fluorocarbon tippet for an overall leader length of 11 to 13 feet, which is plenty. Once you have your indicator set more than about 10 feet from your uh, fly, it becomes difficult to land fish with a typical handheld landing net. You'll need a long handled net if you're going to fish deeper than that. There is a solution, and I'll talk about that in just a second when I talk about indicators. To join my main leader to my tippet section, I use a triple surgeon's knot. It's simple, easy to tie. Even when I'm on the water getting getting pounded by rain and wind, if I need to replace my tippet, triple surgeon's knot is an easy one to use. Easier than a blood knot, in my opinion, by far. I talk about strike indicators. You have to have something, <laughs> a bobber is a good word for it. You have to have something that will allow your fly to sink down into the water column and then to hold it so that it's in that vertical curved comma like shape that I talked about. And as the waves bounce your indicator around, your fly is moving down there too. Indicator goes down, set the hook. It's as simple as that. You could even do this, a child could do this with a spinning rod or a spin cast rod. All they need is some sort of small float. They could use a bigger one than this, a clear plastic bubble. You can fill that thing part way up with water and you can cast it a mile. You could fish a chronomid pupa under that and do extremely well. It'll work just fine. Some other indicators that I've used in the past and I still use on occasion. By the way, this one is an airlock strike indicator. Our lightning strike football shape strike indicators. They come in a number of different colors and I carry a number of different colors with me because depending on the light conditions, you may be able to see one color better than other at a given day and time. The airlock indicators come in more colors too. This one happens to be orange, although I, most of the time I prefer the pink one. 
And if I'm fishing really deep, let's say the water is 13 feet deep and I want to fish a chronomid pupa and I want to fish it a foot off the bottom. That means I'm going to have 12 feet of line between my indicator and my fly. That's going to make it very difficult to land fish. But if I use an indicator like this, which is one of Phil Rowley's quick strike strike indicators. It has a hole through the stem. With this, I have a way to actually rig the indicator up there at 12 feet. Then when a fish strikes, this will come apart and the whole works will slide down my line towards my fly so that I can wind in the fish closer to my rod tip so that I'm able to net it. Note that with the quick strike indicator, you can fish it at 12 feet deep, you can fish it at 3 feet deep. It, wait, it works the same, but no matter what, every time you hook a fish, you're going to have to reset this thing, which is kind of a pain in the butt. So unless I'm fishing strictly deep water, uh, where I have to use a leader longer than 9 feet between my indicator and my fly, unless I'm fishing deep water like that, I tend not to use a quick strike indicator. They have their place. Don't get me wrong, but I tend not to use them most of the time. Okay, continuing up the system. The rod that I'm using here is a custom-made uh, North Fork Composites 9 foot 5 weight that I built. It's in their Classic Series. Works great. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, to the business end of that, I've got a Reddington Rise Reel with a Rio Stillwater Floater fly line. Basically, for a fly line, what you want is a weight forward five weight fly line. A weight forward line will cast a little bit better, especially if it's windy, than say a double taper line. Um, notice on the end of my fly rods, even though this is only a five weight, I built a fighting butt. If it's on there, you won't notice that it's there until you need it, and then you'll be glad it's there because there are some big fish in Alaska's lakes, and if you have a really good day, you might catch a number of them, and they are going to tax your risk. Trust me. So if you build your own rods and you're building a five weight to fish lakes, I recommend you put a fighting butt on the end of it. You'll be glad you did. Okay, the typical presentation for fishing with an indicator is very simple. Try to figure out where you think the fish are. And there are a number of ways to do that. You can look for rising fish, but remember the big fish won't rise very often. You might see one here and there, and that's a good clue that they're around. If you see lots of coronamid pupa hatching in a certain area, you can see them with your eyes next to your float tube or your canoe or your boat or whatever, that's a good area to prospect. If you see birds working a specific part of the lake but not other parts, that's a clue that there may be something going on there that you want to check out. And typically, um, although hat, you know, coronamids will hatch from two feet of water to water as deep as 35 or 40 feet, I typically don't fish with an indicator in water that's 30 feet deep. If I want to fish with an indicator, I'm going to fish any, I, I'm going to set my indicator somewhere between my tippet knot, which is usually at about three feet, and the length of my leader, which is usually about 11 to 13 feet. So somewhere in that depth range is where I'm going to position myself to fish. I'll typically start with my fly about a foot off the bottom. That's a good place to start whether the water is 5 feet deep or the water is 11 feet deep. If you start a foot off the bottom, there's almost always some fish cruising at that depth, especially early in the mornings. As the, as the morning progresses and, and those chronomid pupa continue to rise up through the water column, they do this very slowly, the fish will rise with them. They'll, they'll, where you may be catching them a foot off the bottom early in the day, say in 10 feet of water, by two hours later, the majority of the fish might be four feet off the bottom, cruising around eating the same chronomid pupa. Chronomid pupa can't get away, they're too slow, so the fish just graze along at that level, um, basically swimming through the cloud of chronomids, sucking them in as they go. I fish a lot, and I do a lot of reading, and I, I've read in some still water fly fishing books that you need to be able to cast 60 or 70 feet to catch these spooky big trout. That may be the case in some places, but it's not that way in Alaska. When I'm fishing a coronamid pupa imitation, and I've landed fish up to, I don't know, eight or nine pounds uh, using these things in Alaska's lakes, I rarely cast farther than about 40 feet. 
40 feet is about the distance that my tired old eyes can still see the indicator well, especially if it's bouncing up and down in waves. So I tend to fish as far as I can easily see. I have found in my own experience that the fish in Alaska, as long as you're not splashing and banging things around, they're not terribly spooky. If you're quiet and you're fishing quietly and you're not thrashing the water with your fly line uh, or a canoe paddle or anything like that, you'll, you'll catch fish 15, 20 feet away from you a lot of times. So you don't need to cast too far. And with an indicator, you're just going to flip it out there and you're going to watch it. I tend to fish with the wind at my back. That helps keep my fly line straight and I can either kick to kind of hold myself in position because I don't want that I don't want to be drifting all over the lake. I want to be fairly stable. Or if the wind isn't too strong, I'll drop my float tube anchor and let that hold me. I'll try to keep a straight line to the fly, and when the indicator goes down, I'll set the hook. If there isn't much wind, every once in a while I'll move the the, the fly just a little bit by stripping in six inches of line at a whack like this. Strip, strip. And then I'll let it sit. And I might let it sit there for 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Um, and then I'll do it again. It's slow fishing. It's, it seems like it might be kind of tedious. And for somebody who can't sit still, they may have a problem with this. But I'm telling you, if you're anchored or you're barely moving, you are not spooking the area. And if fish are around, they will rarely refuse a coronamid pupa. Even if we're in... The fall, when the when the coronamid hatch is virtually over, there's still a few popping up all, all during the open water se season. But even if they aren't keyed in on coronamid pupa, fish will rarely pass one up. They're an easy meal. So that's basically the deal with fishing an indicator. There isn't a whole lot more to it. The second presentation that I want to talk about, and I talked about this in my 2012 uh, Coronamid Chronicles article, it was in the April issue of 2012, if you want to order the back in the back issue. The second method is fishing vertically with a fast sinking fly line. To fish vertically with a coronamid pupa, first you have to have a situation in which you think it'll work. And for me, that means water that's 20 feet deep to about 35 feet deep. I rarely fish deeper than that. It doesn't work very well shallow because your fly line is going to be going straight down from your rod tip and the fish usually don't like to swim underneath your float tube fins unless the water is very deep. So I like, I catch a lot of fish in about 20 to 25 feet of water doing this technique. You need to be able to anchor. It works really good on those flat calm days when you can't seem to get the fish to bite a chronomid pupa under an indicator, possibly because the wind isn't animating your indicator so your fly isn't getting animated. When we fish vertically, the flies are the same. In fact, most of the time in Alaska, if I'm going to fish a chronomid pupa, I almost always start with a black snow cone with a red rib, usually in size 12. Size 14 and size 10 are also good. For tippet, I'm still using 3X tippet, the same tippet that I used with the indicator. The difference in this case is I don't have a main leader that's, you know, 8 to 12 feet long. In, in this instance, I just got a section of 3X tippet. It's about five feet long total to my fly line. My fast sinking fly line, what do I mean by that? Well, if I'm gonna fish in 20 feet of water or 30 feet of water, I want a fly line that goes out there and basically plummets as fast as possible until it's straight up and down in the water column. That's, that's what I'm shooting for. You can do this with a type three fly line, but you'll do better if you have a type six or a type seven. This is Rio, I think this is Rio's lake line, type seven, fast sinking, sinking line. It's weight forward and it works really, really well for fishing the vertical presentation. It also works well for some of the other present presentations we use, like sliding with a floating dragonfly imitation or a booby. Anyway, this fast sinking line is going to get you vertical quickly and that's what you want. So let's say I'm out there in 20 feet of water on Finger Lake or 25 feet of water. I'm going to drop my anchor, and in order to do this from a float tube, you can't have 12, 15 miles an hour wind or your anchor simply will not hold. But if we have a calm day and the fish aren't showing um, in the shallower water that we oftentimes prefer to fish, I'll go out there, drop my anchor in 20, 25, 30 feet of water and use this technique. I'll take my fly 
once I'm ready to fish and I've got my anchor set. Once my anchor is set, what I'll do is I'll clip on a pair of forceps to my the bend of the hook of my fly like this. I'll put my rod out into the water as if I were fishing with the rod tip just barely in the water and I'll strip out fly line slowly until I feel the forceps hit the bottom. Once that happens, I'll strip the fly line back in, not wind it in, but strip it in, let it accumulate on the floor of the boat or on my stripping apron. Reach up, take the fly off of the forceps, vice versa. Then I know I have just enough line for my fly to be sitting on the bottom. I will cast the fly line out. I'll reel in about two reel turns, which for my reels puts my fly about a foot off the bottom, and then I'm ready to fish. And all I do is I sit here, my rod is pointed just barely into the water, and I'm just stripping like this. Strip, 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 about an inch at a time like that, and then I wait. Strip, strip, and so on. About four, four times at a time, an inch per strip, about an inch per second, with a pause in between of several seconds. This, sometimes the fish are taking the fly right near the bottom. Sometimes they're taking up in deep water like that. Sometimes they're taking the pupa halfway to the surface. Occasionally, in clear water, I've been able to look down where I can see the end of my fly line down in the water column. I can't quite see my fly or anything, and I've had the rod nearly jerked out of my hands. One of the fun things about fishing a chronomid pupa vertically like this, and this is just speculation on my part, but it, they really bite it hard sometimes. And I think the reason is they see the fly moving up above them. They swim up, they grab it, and they immediately turn to go back to the level they were at. The result is a hard pull on your fly rod. It's really fun. And it's very, very effective sometimes. When it's really effective, boy, you can really have a heyday fishing that way. So that's two techniques that I use to fish chronomid pupa in South Central Alaska Lakes. These techniques work all over the western part of the United States, wherever trout are found in lakes. Hopefully this will give you a little bit better idea of what you can do in South Central Alaska's lakes to do a little bit better with your fly fishing. And uh, until I talk to you again, I hope you have a great day, stay healthy, and we'll see you on the lake.